Let's do this. How's it going, everybody? It's Shark Week. And you know, I've had a lot of people over the years that I've been on YouTube ask me to make shark-related content on this particular week in the middle of the summer. But so far, I have not done it. And it's not because I don't like sharks. I love sharks. Sharks are awesome. But if I'm being honest, I don't really care for Shark Week. Now, if you grew up in the 90s and early 2000s like I did, you probably remember a time that I like to call the golden age of educational programming. This was the time when networks like PBS and Discovery gave platform to some legends. Gods among men, like the Krat Brothers. Uh, sometimes they don't. And Jeff Corwin. And and Nigel Marvin. Got you, Matilda. And the undeniable greatest of all time, Steve Irwin. I've had some wildlife encounters in my life, but the emotions that I felt in my heart, I was nearly crying. These individuals are really the inspiration for science communicators today. I will tell you right now that if it wasn't for these people, I would not be talking to you right now. And it doesn't matter who, chances are if you follow any science communicator who talks about animals in any capacity today, they will probably say the exact same thing. And Shark Week existed during this time. This is actually where it rose to prominence. And although starting out, it was a little bit more sensationalized, hell, the first official host of Shark Week was Peter Benchley, the guy who wrote the novel that would eventually become the movie Jaws. So that kind of explains where they were going with it originally. But during this golden age, things were starting to get better, at least for a while. I mean, for three years, from 2000 to 2002, the host of the event was Nigel Marvin, and the focus started to get back into education and conservation instead of painting sharks as monsters. But unfortunately, as we come to the end of the decade, the golden age of educational programming would come to an end. And as we get more into the 2010s, well, things would get bad. I actually remember the exact moment that I fully lost faith in the Discovery Channel. That would be the summer of 2013. And I want to share this story with you all. So gather around, children. This is why I hate Shark Week. I was a young, stupid man at this time who was doing something else with his life besides starting a YouTube channel. But this particular week, I was doing basically nothing, because I was sick. Like, very sick. Like, I remember if my fever went up one more degree, I was going to the hospital kind of sick. And I had been in this state for several days. So I was very unwell. And I had been in bed for like three days straight, and I could barely keep anything down. Bad times. And I had been asleep for like 36 hours, and I remember I woke up, and it was like 3 a.m. And I was at a point where, even though I was still sick and tired, I wasn't sleepy, you know? So I took some medicine, and I laid back down, and I turned on the TV, and I just started flipping through channels. And I was flipping along, and then I saw this. And I laid there, and I stared at the TV in my delirious NyQuil induced state and I watched what in that moment looked like a news story breaking about a whale washing up on shore after being attacked and bitten in half I sat there dumbstruck flabbergasted and I was like N no N that no this I what so, of course, I kept watching, and as I'm seeing this show unfold, exactly what I was thinking was confirmed. They were thinking that this thing was attacked by a Megalodon! I didn't even realize that I was watching the Discovery Channel at first. For all I knew, this was a news outlet with a breaking story. These people were saying that Megalodon still exists. And then it cut to commercial, and my dumbass was on the edge of the bed freaking out. Then, the commercial break ended, and a disclaimer popped up. 
Now this disclaimer didn't even actually say that this was fake. It was very vague, but it was enough to make me kind of tilt my head and go, wait, what? And then a little Shark Week thing popped up in the corner of the screen, and I went, what? What the f This was a fictional show that was being treated very seriously. In fact, if someone missed that disclaimer that popped up for like a split second after each commercial break, there was nothing to indicate in this program that it was all fictitious. And that really, really didn't sit well with me. I sat there and I thought to myself, if I could sit here and, in a delirious, drug-induced state, watch this and for a split second think to myself, oh my god, this is real, then there are absolutely people who are going to walk away from this convinced that this is actually happening. Because this is the Discovery Channel. Why would they make stuff up? Wait a minute. Doesn't the Discovery Channel also own Animal Planet? Yeah, what of it? Well... Didn't they air a completely fake documentary talking about the existence of mermaids being covered up by the Navy? Like, they did this big old conspiracy thing with fake footage and interviews with actors pretending to be scientists, and it got enough people to believe the hoax that Noah actually had to put out a statement saying that it was all lies. Which, as you can imagine, did next to nothing to change the minds of people who jumped on board this conspiracy hoax in the first place. Yeah, that was pretty bad. But that was different. Mermaids are just fake. At least Megalodon did exist at one time. I'm just saying. The writing was kind of on the wall here. And the mermaids thing came out the year before in 2012. Discovery as a whole was just kind of getting into hoaxes and conspiracy theory nonsense. Yeah, you do have a point. In both cases, they went so far as to hold interview shows afterward with the leading scientists or whistleblowers where they get even deeper into the weeds on these conspiracies. And you know, the, this whole subject is actually something that I'm really interested in talking about. There's like a whole big rabbit hole or even possibly an iceberg video worth of stuff within the rise and fall of the golden age of educational programming. I find it all very fascinating, and honestly, I could see myself covering it more in depth. So comment below if you would actually like to hear about that. There's even more that kind of directly correlates in with paleontology topics. The best person I've seen cover it here on YouTube is a channel called Billiam. I've never interacted with him before, but I do love his content, especially the stuff when he's talking about topics like this. But needless to say, this documentary really bothered me. It turned me against Shark Week, Discovery, and even was part of the reason why I got rid of Cable altogether. But unfortunately, no longer giving them my money was not going to stop Discovery's tomfoolery from impacting my life. For you see, I was sadly all too correct about my fears that people were going to fall for these shenanigans for ratings. Which, by the way, absolutely worked. 2013 was Shark Week's highest rated year. But polls afterward actually have indicated that around 70% of people who watched this documentary actually believed it was real. And that is when something started happening that, in my opinion, is 100% Discovery Channel's fault. That being, random people coming to me and other people in the field of paleontology and asking or even wanting to argue about the conspiracy of the continued existence of Megalodon a 60-foot macro-predatory shark alive today. So, for my first Shark Week special, I would like to clear the blood in the water and right one of the many wrongs of the educational network that made me who I am today before they turned to the dark side. So in order to really understand how implausible it is for Megalodon to still exist, you have to understand the role that this animal filled in its environment. Megalodon was a shark that, although its size is undeniably impressive, also had its shortcomings that most other large predatory sharks don't have. And it actually all stems from its great size. Megalodon is thought to have weighed up to around 60 tons. For comparison, the largest great white ever recorded was almost four tons. 
And that was a freak of nature, almost double the size of the average. Now, Megalodon did live alongside Great Whites, and it's very possible that Great Whites would have competed with Juvenile Megalodon for food. But the thing is, once a Megalodon got to even half of its adult size, the pinnipeds and small to medium sized fish that they competed with Great Whites for as babies weren't going to cut it anymore. Megalodon evolved to this great size for one reason, to hunt the largest animals that have ever lived. They hunted baleen whales, and as a full-grown adult, nothing else in the ocean would be enough to feed it. They had become hyper-specialists. They did this because during the Miocene, there was a huge explosion in whale diversity. So there were suddenly whales in huge numbers all throughout the world's oceans. This created the ideal environment for a predator to specialize in hunting them if it could get big enough. Hell, it became such a good strategy that it actually happened more than once. Liviatan was basically a sperm whale on steroids, and was probably the only real direct competition for Megalodon once it reached maturity. In fact, I don't think that there's any evidence that has been found, but it wouldn't be a stretch to say that these two predators probably took each other out on occasion, as competing apex predators often do. During the late Miocene and early Pliocene, these animals were on top of their game. Megalodon would have to compete with other sharks when they were young, but once they reached adulthood, they would become whale killers, with only one other competitor to challenge them. This strategy worked out well, but it also put them in a precarious position, because now, the survival of both these predators directly depended on there being enough whales to go around. This was the case in the Miocene, but as the planet cooled, glaciers grew, and the continents shifted, the planet would no longer be as well suited to these great predators. One thing that we know about Megalodon from the fossils that we have found is that it appeared to perform more tropical waters. It's actually one of the most common fossils that we find here in Florida where I live. And it, along with Liviatan, ruled the oceans for a long time. But during the latter half of the Pliocene, we see some major changes to the environment in the world's oceans. The glaciers at the poles were growing, and although this doesn't seem like a big deal to something that was predominantly living in the tropics, there are two things that that does affect. For one thing, this is going to lead to lower sea levels. More water being locked up in ice at the poles means less water in the oceans. And the other thing to consider is that salt does not freeze. So as water froze up at the poles, the salt in the seawater was being left behind. So this all meant that the world got cooler, therefore sea levels got lower and cooler, so less tropical and more salty. The ocean was being thrown out of balance and this started to lead to a pretty substantial extinction. And it's also believed that this was made even worse by the formation of the land bridge between North and South America. This would have an impact on many different whale species at the time because this would completely cut off their migration routes. This made it impossible for whales who were more well adapted to tropical waters to even be able to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific. In the end, all of this would result in the extinction of around 36% of the large marine species, and as much as 55% of the whales specifically. Now we know that Megalodon could survive in colder waters, but this was something that it couldn't bounce back from. In the end, this animal had become so specialized to hunting the biggest prey on Earth that if you take that prey away, it would struggle hard to be able to get enough calories to stay alive as an adult. An animal that is designed to hunt whales can't just switch to hunting seals or something and be able to get enough to eat. Anytime that you see an extinction event take place in any ecosystem, the apex predators in that ecosystem are almost always among the casualties. And all real scientific evidence seems to point to that being the case here as well, for both of these whale-killing super predators. So, one thing that I noticed about this mockumentary, Megalodon the Monster Shark Lives, is if you read between the lines and understand that this is all fake from the start, they kind of show us exactly why it's very clear that Megalodon is definitely not surviving in the world's oceans today. 
Because here's the thing. Crazy imagery like whales washing up on shore dead bitten in half and boats being attacked would not have been something that only would have first been documented in 2013. This would have been a common occurrence all throughout human history. The documentary shows a boat being attacked by a megalodon. And it's implied that this is basically like when great white sharks attack surfers mistaking them for seals. Only in this case, the boat is being mistaken for a whale. And I agree, if Megalodon did exist, this not only could, but would happen all the time. If Megalodon still existed today, we would see people getting attacked by babies mistaking us for seals, and adults would be attacking boats fairly regularly, every bit as regularly as great white sharks attack people for that exact same reason. Which is not as common as the media likes to make it seem, but it's common enough to actually be something that we understand does happen. And going out on a limb here, even if Megalodon did survive until more recently than the fossil record suggests, we as a species have actually made the world even less well suited to their survival than it was when we believe they went extinct. Because we have done a lot of whale hunting ourselves, devastating their population even further, and thus making attacks by starving Megalodon even more likely. And as a final thought that I want to leave you on, everybody knows that sharks have a ridiculously amazing sense of smell, especially when it comes to smelling blood, right? Yes? It's like their whole thing. So keeping in mind everything that we just discussed, we as a species have been actively hunting whales for somewhere between six and 4,000 years. Is it more likely that a 60-foot whale-eating super predator that has barely held off starvation for 3 million years just ignored us spilling whale blood in the world's oceans for 6,000 years? Or is it more likely that this giant is extinct? Have a good one, everybody.